Welcome to Connection Church, and if you are watching this later online, it might look a little different. Our light did not pop on uh, like it normally does, but you know what? I'm going to say that's okay. Uh, Haley and I had the chance to go to a 21 Pilots concert last night, and they had a campfire thing that was supposed to pop on when they were doing an acoustic portion of their set, and it didn't come on. <laughs> And Tyler said that it was okay because they only paid twenty five thousand dollars for it, so it didn't really it didn't really matter that it. But we didn't pay twenty five thousand dollars for that light, so I don't feel bad that that light didn't come on. They eventually got the fire to come on, and it was kind of like roaring, and it was you almost feel the heat where we were, like way up in the upper deck. So uh, it was crazy, but it was a really good time. Um, yeah, we got to go to the concert. It was really fun. Uh, we were in Boston, and so it's about a three and a half to four hour drive for those of you who have not driven to Boston from here. On the way there, it was actually a five and a half hour drive because of traffic. And then we got in. They did uh, about a two hour, 15 minute set. They started at nine. We took the train back to where we were staying in Boston. Got to sleep around 1.15. I got up at five this morning and then made the trek back to New York so that I could preach to you guys this morning. So that if that doesn't tell you how excited I am to preach, then I don't know. I can't tell you anything else if that story doesn't do it. Uh, we actually, I, I'm a huge 21 Pilots fan. You guys know I've, I've used them as uh, illustrations several times. And they actually released tour dates several months back. And we picked the date as soon as we saw Boston was the closest they were coming. Uh, we, we snagged tickets to the garden, to the big venue. And, and then Daniel was like, hey, I'm going to be... I'm going to be out of town this weekend, and I, I've got you lined up to preach on Sunday. I was like, that's awesome. But in my head, I was like, I'm still going to the 21 Pilots concert. I'm, I'll preach, but I'm still going to the concert. Um, and it, it, was, it was amazing. It was phenomenal. Um, I highly recommend if you guys haven't checked them out. Uh, it's two Christian guys who, on the surface level of their music, is just their – it's – it's kind of mainstream. It's very unique what they do. They mix a lot of genres, but a lot of their stuff people would consider mainstream. But if you look into their lyrics, it's very, very deep uh, how far it goes. And it's, it's very, very strongly biblically based uh, Christian ideas. And so uh, check them out if you haven't. I highly recommend it. All right. So as far as the sermon is concerned, uh, we will be going over 21 pilot set list. So if you'll pull from <laughs> my um, We're going to be in Acts chapter 4 today. So if you guys would turn to Acts chapter 4. We have been speaking on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and how amazing that is and, and how God wants to use the Holy Spirit in our lives to completely transform our life. And so I thought it might be really cool for us to jump into Acts chapter 4 today and to, to look into what, what are some practical, uh, some practical signs and applications we can see in our own lives from receiving this power. In other words, what does it look like when we're going into our day-to-day -day life and something really cool happens? How do we know whether to credit the Holy Spirit for that? Or maybe that's just like a skill that God gave us, and or maybe it was just dumb luck. When we're trying to pick out the, the things in our life that we can accredit to the Holy Spirit and God's work versus just things that happen, what does that look like? Well, we have the answer in Scripture, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 4. And what I'd like to do is I would like to read Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1, and going all the way through verse 22 to open us up. So we'll read the whole thing, I'll pray over the scripture, and then we'll break it down. So starting in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, As they were speaking to the people, so these are Peter and, and other disciples, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Verse 3, they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Aeneas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. 
verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. The builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Verse 14, But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the power of your word. God, thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. God, thank you for the examples that you give us in your word of how the Holy Spirit can work in and around and through our lives to impact not only our life, but the lives of those around us. God, for your purposes and for your good and ultimately for your glory. We just pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So here we are. We jump in in chapter four. And at the very beginning, uh, Peter has already been speaking uh, in Solomon's portico, is, is what it's called in, in my Bible. He's speaking to the people, and he's, he's telling them about this Jesus that has transformed his life. And as they're speaking, as we start in chapter four, it says, as they were speaking to the people, uh, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, some other leaders came up, and they, they were really annoyed because they were preaching in the power of Jesus. And at this point, the leaders, uh, Jewish leaders, did not really receive this message. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so you have all these other disciples of Jesus going around in your temples and in your places of holy worship saying, no, 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 it's not what the Jewish religious leaders are telling you. It's actually Jesus. It's the power of Jesus that saves you. And so these leaders were very annoyed. I mean, you can imagine if somebody walked into our church right now and was like, no, 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 it's not Jesus. It's if you follow these 10 rules, that's how you get into heaven. That would annoy us, right? Except we would be on the right side of the argument. Um, but we would be annoyed, right? So this is where they are. They're in their holy place of worship, and, and they're saying, no, 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 okay, we can't allow these people to talk about the power of Jesus. And what has given them the the gall, so to speak, to go into these places of worship and to speak the name of Jesus. These disciples who many times when they were in the presence of Jesus did not even really realize who they were really in the presence of. Many times they had questions when we look back now and we have scripture to, to kind of aid us in our entire view of who Jesus is. We think to ourselves, how could you possibly be in the presence of the Christ and ask how you're going to feed people? How can you possibly be in the presence of the Christ and ask, why haven't you gone up to the, the festival yet? Or why aren't you here? Or why aren't you doing this? How could you question Jesus if you really understood who he was? And the answer is, even in the midst of Jesus and his presence, the disciples did not fully understand who Jesus was. And these other religious leaders do not fully understand who Jesus is. And so out of nowhere, Peter, even after we see uh, just a little while before at the crucifixion of Jesus, denying Jesus three times, right? And the third time he denies Jesus is actually to what many scholars believe, like a small girl, right? She's like, hey, I saw you with Jesus one time. And he's like, no, 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 that wasn't me. He was very timid. He was afraid. He was scared of what would happen if he was lumped in with this message of the power of Christ. But then we see after the ascension, 
boldness. Not only is he speaking the name of Jesus, he's going directly into the houses of worship of the people who oppose him, who have power in their society, and saying, no, no, this is wrong, and Jesus is the only way. So the first thing that we see in Acts chapter 4, when we're looking for practical signs and applications of what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to work through our lives, is the Holy Spirit makes the timid bold. The Holy Spirit makes the timid bold. Starting in verse 1, it says, As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. All the leaders. And they were annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection. And then what did they do? They arrested them. And they put them in custody until the next day. Do you think Peter and John and the disciples went in and, and preached the name of Jesus in these temples, having no idea that being arrested was a possibility? Of course they knew that they might be arrested. But they went in anyway. And it says, even though they were arrested until the next day, because it was already evening, many had already heard and many had already believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. You look in verse 13, it says, When they saw the boldness, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. How could you possibly preach with such boldness, such confidence, such assurance, when you are not, you were just common men? We've seen you around. You denied Jesus. We know who you are, Peter. This is not Peter. This is something else happening inside of Peter that we cannot explain. And it was the work and the power of the Holy Spirit moving through Peter and John and the other disciples, transforming their timid and fearful nature into boldness and assurance. So the first thing that we see is the Holy Spirit makes the timid bold. I think it's really crazy in 13 through 14. Um, it says they recognized, after it says they were astonished, it says they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And it's so crazy to me that the Holy Spirit is so powerful that the disciples' actions after the ascension of Jesus, after they're actually not in his presence anymore, the Holy Spirit is so powerful and makes them so bold that it's actually evident that they had been in his presence. So they're with Jesus, and people are kind of like, are you with Jesus? We're like, no, we're not really with him. Or, or, oh, yeah, we're not really sure what he's about. He's supposed to be saving us, but we don't know what's going on. But then after he leaves and he sends the Holy Spirit, things start happening, and immediately it's recognized, oh, you must have been with Jesus. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus inside of us. It's Jesus' power speaking through us. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit, is that when the Holy Spirit gives you so much boldness, your connection with Jesus is more evident than when you're without the Holy Spirit. Or for the disciples, it's more evident than they, when they were actually with Jesus. They were with Jesus and didn't have the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't that evident that they knew anything about Jesus or really what he stood for or, or what his plan was for their life. Then Jesus leaves, they get the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden they understand it perfectly. So much so that they're speaking boldly in the temples of the leaders that oppose them. The second thing we see is also in verse 13. It says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. So the second thing we see is that the Holy Spirit makes the common uncommon. The Holy Spirit makes the common uncommon. In fact, the Holy Spirit provides such an uncommon good that even those who oppose its effects have no way to argue it. The Holy Spirit produces such good that even in the midst of someone who says, I don't agree with that, there is literally no angle to argue what actually happened. In verse 14, it says, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. The Holy Spirit's power speaks for itself. The Holy Spirit's power needs no defense. Because when things are happening in our life that are truly caused by the Holy Spirit, people will stand in astonishment and amazement and say, how in the world, Austin, did you do that? Because I know you, but this thing just happened. And there's no way that you did that. So what actually happened? It's the Holy Spirit. 
When they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. I think it's really interesting, the wording here, because these religious leaders are really used to only really preaching to educated men, and, and they kind of hold their conversations with the higher-ups, and they say, look, this thing is so evident, the power of the Holy Spirit is so obvious that everyone in Jerusalem understands it. So how are we to refute what happened? It's not just the leaders that saw this happen. Everybody understands the message of the, the risen and ascended Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, and we cannot refute what happened. What, Haley, one time, she took me to the World Series. I don't, know if he, I don't know if I've told you this like story, but one of the coolest things that I've ever done, one of the coolest birthday presents I've ever received was uh, in November of 2010, we're sitting in our living room, and I'm a huge Texas Rangers fan, and they are terrible. They are not a good baseball player. Mm-hmm. But we had a glorious like three-year run, and uh, in 2010, also if you know anything about baseball, usually the even years, the San Francisco Giants win the World Series. <laughs> so I'll give you a hint. It was 2010. <laughs> but we're sitting in our living room, and we're playing the Yankees in the ALCS. The, the despised Yankees, or the beloved Yankees. It's one or the other. There's no one between. And we destroyed them that year. Absolutely destroyed them. And I can remember sitting in the living room and, and watching uh, one of our players kind of just put like the nail in the coffin, hitting a home run in a, in a late inning, and just thinking, we're going to the World Series. And it finally wrapped up. And as soon as the last pitch was, was over, the game was over, I'm jumping up and down with a friend. We're, we're giving each other hugs. We're going to the World Series, you know. And Haley just disappeared from the living room. And I was like, where'd she go? And she comes um, out of her bedroom with an envelope. And she's like, here, I got you something. And I open it up. And it's two tickets to the World Series that she couldn't give to me until she actually saw we were going to the World Series, right? <clears throat> and so we got to go to game four of the 2010 World Series in Arlington, Texas. And let me tell you, the 21 Pilots concert was super awesome. It's definitely up there. But I don't know if I've ever been in an atmosphere like a World Series game, especially with a bunch of Texans. It was <laughs> wild, okay? Um, and so we, we get in there. It's just electric atmosphere. And, you know, you watch these things on TV. There was a really dominant pitcher that the Giants had that year, and he was the closer. And basically, if they had a lead going into the ninth inning, you weren't going to win. He was very electric. His name's Brian Wilson. If you don't know anything about him, he was kind of crazy. He would come out and stomp and scream, and he'd get out on the mound and, you know, just he was very, very um, intimidating. He was just an intimidating presence. But on, on TV, you're like, come on, we can hit this guy. Why can't we hit this guy? This is, this is crazy that we can't. We're the best offense in the entire major leagues. We got, we got this. Let me tell you, in person, I knew why we weren't hitting the things mm-hmm. that he was throwing. Because the movement on his fastball and slider, it was, it, it was crazy. It, the ball was there, and then it was gone. And combine that with his just total intimidating just presence. And I just thought, man, we're going to be lucky if we even touch the ball. I remember like audibly cheering when we fouled one straight back to the dugout. Yes, we touched it. There's a chance, you know. There was no chance. He struck everyone out in that inning. And we eventually lost the next game. Um, But my point is this. Even though I did not like Brian Wilson, even though it was frustrating watching him just completely shut our powerful offense down, I could not refute his greatness. I had no defense. I couldn't say, oh, well, he just got lucky because our team was having a bad day. You know, sometimes your team loses and you think, well, we really beat ourselves. Uh Uh-uh. I could not. He was just in the zone. I've never seen anybody pitch like that in my life. And... That's the same way that actions from us should be when they come from the Holy Spirit. When people are are engaging the things that are happening around us in our life, if the Holy Spirit is lively and active and we're continually going to God's Word and we're submitting our life to God and we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control what happens, we're going to be like 10 times better than Brian Wilson was on the mound in 2010. And people are going to walk up and say, I cannot refute. Everyone saw this amazing thing happen. And, and we literally have no defense against it. 
And so jumping back into Acts chapter 4, when we look at the religious leaders that were so upset, they're like, how, how are we going to, to dodge this bullet? Because we're, we're trying to keep this status quo. We've got people in here saying, no, 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 the status quo is follow Jesus, and we don't like that. So what can we do if we can't refute it? Well, verse 17, it says, In order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they could not refute. They could not debunk. They had no defense against it. The only thing they could do is try to use their power of fear to suppress what was going on. It's the only thing they could do. So when we're walking out in our day-to-day -day life and we have the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing anyone can do to stop the Holy Spirit. If you're writing anything down this whole morning, write that down. There is nothing anyone or anything or any being can do to stop the power and the will of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that can happen is that we can be backed into a corner or scared into suppressing the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing. And so when we walk out in our day-to-day -day lives, we should walk out in victory knowing that we carry the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only thing stopping the Holy Spirit's work in our life is us. Towards the end of the 22 verses that we read, Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through 22, it says, Peter and John answered them. They answered the leaders and they said, hey, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you about not preaching God's name anymore, is it right to listen to you or is it right to listen to God? You judge. You're the religious leaders here. You tell us. Should we listen to what you, a person, says or listen to what God says? Because we can't but speak of what we've seen and heard. This is so powerful. It's welling up inside of us so much. It's so evident that everyone in Jerusalem saw it. How can we not speak of what happened? It's impossible. When the leaders had further threatened them, being Peter and John, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. So you're the religious leader of a God that's being praised. How are you to punish the people who like ushered in that praise for your God? You can't. It says, For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. More than 40 years. And remember the sign was back in chapter 3. where he went. I don't know if you've heard the song. He went walking and leaping and praising God. I don't know if you have that song. But uh, yeah, he got up and walked after being lame for over 40 years. So the third thing that we see that the Holy Spirit does See, makes the unwise wise. The Holy Spirit makes the unwise wise. What a response. Hey, you. I know you saw this Jesus thing happen, and you think it's real, and everybody else thinks it's real, but, but don't say anything else about it. And Peter's response was, well, you're the religious leader. Should I do what God tells me to do, or should I do what you tell me to do? What a Jesus move, right? Man, what a straight-up gangster Jesus move. I mean, like answer, like answer a, a command with a question, right? Hey, don't do that. Well, should I do what God says or what you say? Hmm, you know, you tell me. I don't know. And then he goes on to say, how can we not speak about what we've seen? Almost calling into question, how are you not speaking about this? Not only are you not speaking about it, you're trying to suppress it. And this is something that's amazing that God has done how is that happening? And then they threaten them some more. And the Holy Spirit continued to defend them. They couldn't punish them because everybody was praising God. Again, the Holy Spirit needs no defense. It can defend itself. And so this somewhat of a predicament that Peter and John find themselves in, because of the Holy Spirit and because of their submission to the Holy Spirit's action in their life, not just to the amazing things that happen, but to the response of the conflict that comes from that, their gifted wisdom, their gifted defense, and they're let, they're let free. 
because there's nothing that these people can do to stop the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how strong of a leader they are. It doesn't matter what kind of following they've had in the past. There is nothing they can do to stop the Holy Spirit. And when they saw that their attempts to suppress the Holy Spirit had failed, they had no other choice but to just let them go. So we see in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22 up to this point, right? That the Holy Spirit makes the timid bold. It makes the common uncommon, and it makes the unwise wise. So what do we do with that information? That's awesome. Like Maybe you already feel emboldened by the Holy Spirit, or maybe you already feel like you've been a part of some uncommon things because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you feel like the Holy Spirit has given you the opportunity to make some wise decisions. I hope that's the case for all of you. If you haven't experienced those things, I pray that engaging in the Holy Spirit will give you the opportunity to experience those things. And my challenge is this. The takeaway is this. We had the three points, right? Makes timid bold, makes the common uncommon, makes the unwise wise. You can write those down. It's awesome if you did. In addition to no one can stop the Holy Spirit, I would also like you to write down the challenge, which is for us as a church to live and walk in the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus desires to use that power through us for our good and for the good of his people. Live and walk in the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus desires to use that power through us for our good and for the good of his people. Let's pray. God, you are just so amazing. Lord, the gift of your son and what that means to us. I can't even really put into words. Lord, it's everything. But the fact that through that gift, you wanted to utilize the sacrifice of your son to not only save us from death, but empower us with the Holy Spirit, to literally give us yourself to live within us so that we can walk with your power in our everyday lives, God, so that you can make us bold, so that you can allow us to be part of uncommon, incredible things that happen. Lord, that you can work in us. God, we are just so, so, so grateful. Lord, for the wisdom that you provide. God, I pray that we would lean into your scripture. God, that we would lean into a time of prayer and a time of just coming into your presence every day, Lord, that allows us to access the power of the Holy Spirit that you so freely give us, Lord, for our good and for the good of others, for your purposes, Lord, for your glory. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you guys would uh, say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.